Good morning all, my name's uh, Robert Noble, I cover the UK and Irish banks at Deutsche Bank. With me here today is Andy Halfords, the CFO of uh, Standard Charter. Good morning Andy. Hi there Robert, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I am well, I'm well, looking forward to being able to travel again one day, but well otherwise. Good stuff. Um, Maybe we can just start with, if you could just, you know, given the unique footprint that you have as, a, as an Asian uh, bank in the UK, can you give us an overview of how the recovery is progressing in the, in the geographies that some people might not be so familiar with? And maybe particularly in India, could you update us on what the situation is currently and, and how the business looks there? Yeah, so I'd say the pattern, with the exception maybe of the India situation, is fairly similar to what we talked about in February. So generally speaking, the volumes of activity in Northern Asia are the strongest. And if you look at some of the export data out of China and places like that, in fact, it's very, very strong. Then as one comes down through Southern Asia, I'd say it's still in a sort of slight holding pattern. I think people sort of seeing the light at the, at the end of the tunnel, but still being a little bit reticent just about quite where this is going. And with the uh, India situation, obviously having a little bit of a, a worry from a number of countries, still the Southern Asia sort of side. Uh, India itself, well, I think for people living in the country, it's clearly a really, really difficult time. Probably a little bit too early to actually um, see the impact on trading activity in the in actual market itself, but the logic being that there will be some impact um, from that as we move forwards over a period of time. Um, Europe and America's, you know, probably sort of holding their own now, so not, not um, not doing too badly, and Africa and the Middle East, again, sort of in that middle territory, I think people still are watchful of COVID. The bottom line is COVID's not really fully worked its way through. The northern part of our territory definitely the strongest, and I think just a degree of sort of caution still as we move through the coming months, particularly by the India uh, situation of recent weeks. Okay, that's great. Maybe if we talk about the some of the more important product lines then. Um, financial markets and wealth management, they've been standout performers uh, recently. How much of the revenue growth that we've seen here is is sustainable? Can financial markets revenues realistically grow with, with lower volatility? And, and similarly, is, is wealth management, is the, is the strong performance here market price-based versus net new money growth? Or what does the outlook look like for the next rest of the year and then going forward? Yeah, so let, let's sort of split them in two. I'd say on financial markets, we have broadened the product range so that we are less volatility dependent. But that doesn't mean to say that we're not volatility dependent. And clearly in a period when there is unpredictability of rates, um, FX, etc., I think as corporate treasurers are still going to be mindful that they need to be quite careful about how to manage the balance sheet. So we saw a pretty strong Q1 um, in volatile terms and in numeric sense with FM. Um, Q2, I think the market has seen this, has seen a little less volatility, uh, certainly than to some extent in May. And of course, the April of the previous year was an absolute bump on us when uh, all the markets were very strong. And I think going forwards that um, you know we may not see quite the rates that we, we saw at the very peak uh, early of the year, but we still feel that the overall direction of the financial market still feels strong. We still think we have got a good footprint there, we've got good client relationships, um, but we'll have to accept that individual quarters will bobble up and down a little bit as we go through that period. Wealth management, I think, uh, so if you look back to last year, the low point was sort of in the second quarter, people saw the commercial prices in the markets, that was too people, I think, interesting. Then the prices sort of came back and people thought it wasn't such a bad thing. And we actually ended the year pretty strong and we started this year pretty strong. Um, I don't think we're going to see the same sort of growth rates through this year, sorry, the first quarter, but that's just because it was such a strong quarter. 
I think it's, it's not so much a volatility. I think that is more about people having you know, those who have actually been employed throughout this having actually more disposable income to hand in some instances needs to find a place to go and be managed. And um, I'd be hopeful that if we look forwards over one, two, three years, we would see good growth in the wealth management side as we have done for the past several years. Part of that being the new money coming into the region, but part of it just being you know, people's confidence, I think, was picked up from a very low point a while ago. Great, thank you. Um, so you touch on sort of consumers having having more money, investing more in wealth management. There's uh, There's been a good big global spike in, in retail sales that's extended across Asia as well. Is this, should we expect this to start to build into unsecured balance growth in your business as well? Or is, has that started already for you or will, will that come later? And then if you could touch on um, uh, what, what you think about city, the potential for cities, consumer businesses that are up for sale as well. Is, is it the right time for Standard Chartered to pursue growth and in organic yep. expansion of unsecured products? Yep. So, um, first part of your question, uh, unsurprisingly, last year we saw quite a big drop, as did most banks, I think, on the unsecured lending. People were going out less, they were spending less, the balances on accounts were lower, and uh, that was the sort of obvious and understandable consequence of what, uh, what COVID brought about. I think that that confidence is slowly coming back, but it does depend very much market by market. So, given that we have got some markets that you know still got lockdowns going on, it's not a surprise that the level of spending on those isn't quite as high as it is in markets that have actually pulled out of this earlier. So overall, the direction is, is pointing in the right place. But I think, again, it links back to the previous about the pace at which we actually come out of these lockdowns and people get the confidence back. Um, in terms of the city portfolio, look, we, we will have a look at it. Um, we, we clearly, in many of our markets, would benefit from scale. And if we have an opportunity commercially sensibly to actually put more scale onto an existing infrastructure, then, you know, why would we not look at it? Um, that having been said, we need to be thoughtful about it. Um, the sorts of customers that actually City have got are probably customers who have a natural affinity for non-local um, uh, bank accounts and credit cards and so on anyway. So to some extent, we, we may be uh, you know, a beneficiary of some of that sort of transference of activity. Um, we don't need to necessarily go and pay up for that. So it will depend a bit market by market. Um, we're also very mindful of the fact we need to get returns up overall for the bank and we need to make sure that anything we do, if we do do anything, um, is going to be helpful to the cause of actually getting the returns up for the bank. And we're also very aware that the current share price uh, you know, we, we are still sort of trading at some uh, significant discounts sort of book. So we will triangulate all of that. And, um, you know, if there's something that does look of interest, then I'm sure we'll have a look at it closely. If there isn't, then we won't, won't feel compelled to do that. OK, obviously, consumer business um, should have a positive impact on your margins. And they were hammered last year by the by the, the reduction in interest rates globally. We've seen a can't quite believe it, but high ball continues to fall into Q2, but the US yield curve is, is steepening. Are we, are we at the bottom of your, of your NIM? Uh, are, we, are we gonna see a trough in your NIM? And can you <clears throat> maintain your guidance that it will sort of gently increase from H1? Um, I, I would say that high ball continuing to come down, you know, that, that puts a little bit of near return pressure on, pressure on the overall NIM. But it is one currency. Most of the rest of the currencies and interest rates related to them have been, you know, pretty stable through this period. So, you know, whether we're absolutely at the bottom or just sort of very close to the bottom is probably a mute point. I think over the course of this year, we will see roughly where we have been as being sort of the point that we will be likely to be over the coming months. And that obviously then gives us some reasonable hope that when we get into the 2022 year, that actually our numbers are no longer sort of masked by declining rates and instead we can be judged by um, the actual volume of activity within the business. Yeah, so you've, you've spoken about um, at the Q1 results in, in uh, putting on hedges and, and increasing the, the tenor of, of those to take advantage of the change in the interest rate uh, environment. How far have you have you got with in the process of that? Um, and I'd be interested to know what how were you 
using the liquidity beforehand and what are you what sort of length of term are you looking at when you're looking at new hedges yeah so uh, there's a number of factors that we we need to reflect upon as, as any institution does we've got generally a relatively short tenure book and we want to make sure we don't get out the sink in terms of tenures on the other hand we've got some sources of funds like equity which will be around for a long period of time and therefore matching them with slightly longer term um, rates profiles make some sense um, we are literally going through that process at the moment and we're being thoughtful about it um, to the extent that we lock into rates now there is some uplift from where we currently are at on the other hand if rates do over a period of time go up by more than the market is currently expecting then you know we will have locked in already and we wouldn't benefit from the further upside so we will do it sort of thoughtfully we'll do it progressively i think there is some upside from where we've been recently um the the, the caution is we just don't want to not be able to avail ourselves of increases should in a year's time whatever people more confidently be talking about rate increases at that point in time okay great um so as the as the interest rate impacts on margin, hopefully it, it bottoms out. Um, it pulls out, as you mentioned, you should start to see revenue growth. Loan growth has been uh, particularly strong. You've highlighted the opportunity in network revenues, affluent and mass retail revenues all seem substantially in excess of your five to seven percent medium term growth guidance. Do, do, you th do you see these as conservative targets, or what's the what's the drag? Um, that you see versus the opportunity. And why don't you think consensus gives you the credit for what seems conservative targets within revenue forecasts? Um, well, I think to your latter point, people want to see the numbers doing the talking. And uh, I, I think the numbers were doing the talking leading into COVID. And then obviously with COVID, it's, it's sort of produced a bit of a, a pause on that. Uh, I think people want to see us getting back into that space. Um, you know, whether our targets are cautious or not, I don't, I don't know. Um, how would I look at it? Five to seven percent, so six percent midpoint of the range. If you normalize out for COVID, which is a slightly difficult concept at the moment, but you know, if the GDPs are growing in the markets which we're operating around four percent, we're implicitly sort of saying, can we actually uh, nudge a couple of percentage points of growth out over and above GDP growth? I think with what we've been doing in the digital space, the box rollout and things like that, what we're doing in Indonesia with the Nexus platform, um, there are lots of areas to think that we should be able to just do a little better than sort of country average growth rates. And therefore, in that sense, I think that um, being, you know, that five to seven percent range and obviously we'll go as high in it as we possibly can do, I don't think is unreasonable. Um, clearly, within any average number, there will be some that do better and there will be some that do less well. Um, we will try clearly to get the most in the former category, um, but um, I, I think that it seems to us to be a sensible range. It's sort of where we were operating in the quarters leading into COVID, so it's it's not like we're just plucking numbers out of the air. It has got the fact pattern to it. We just need to make sure that as countries come out of the aftermath of COVID, that we you know we are taking our share of that. If we can do that, a six percent growth, you know, it's nearly a billion dollars a top line for us. If we can keep a very good handle on costs, which we intend to do, then the compounding effect of that over two or three years is obviously the very substantive part of how we get to the double digit roti. Do you think the so what's the sensitivity of that of that range, the five to seven percent range, to, to whether you have interest rate rises or not? Can you can you hit that level of revenue growth with no change in in LIBOR rates across the globe? Well, when, when we put the range out, we expressly said that we were assuming a small increase in rates over a multi-year period, but not a very big one. Probably where markets are at the moment, it's slightly bigger than we'd actually factored in. Um, I suppose the way I'd look at it is interest rates would be very helpful. Um, if we were otherwise you know, going to do 7% growth, then we only need to do underlying 6% if rates move a certain amount. So it will be multifaceted here. Um, we, we've put the interest rate sensitivity at roughly just under a billion dollars per 100 basis points of rate change globally for a full year. Um, that is not too different to what we experienced going down the rate curve over the last year. So maybe one and a half percentage points took out about a billion and a half. Um, so again, roughly a billion to 100 basis points sort of uplift. 
I think a good proportion of that, a very good proportion of it, should flow through to the bottom line. Um, you know, if, if the computers are processing things with a high digit on the front, that is not actually increasing um, any of our cost base. And just as we saw the uh, negative effects of it as we came down the curve, I think we should see the positive effects as we move up the curve. So the simple answer is the more of it, the better. Um, we think we can get there even if it's only moderate. Um, at the moment, it probably looks a little bit better than moderate, but um, time will tell. Okay, great. Thank you. If we um, maybe move on to asset quality, um, obviously everything's everything's recovering now, particularly markets, and nobody seems too, too worried anymore. Early alerts have been falling for you since the middle of last year. Are there any material tail risks that you're still worried about? Um, I don't think there's anything that particularly stands out. I mean, obviously, we've got to be focused upon countries where COVID is still proving to be very difficult, and India clearly you know, is, is an example of it. But I think across a portfolio of 60 countries, um, the sort of portfolio averaging effect we think sort of should broadly work through. Um, we had, as you know, a very, very low print on credit impairment p &L costs in the first quarter. Now, that's not going to be replicable across all quarters, but nonetheless, it does start the year off on a pretty good footing. And I think, you know, if, if we could end up the credit impairment at around the billion level this year, let's say, that would be back to 2019 levels. And that would actually mean that the 2020 year, when we were just over 2 billion, we sort of took an excess billion over normal run rate actually think an excess billion on a 300 billion loan book is not too bad. In fact, this time last year, I think I'd have snapped my hand off if I'd said that that was you know, the full impact we were going to see. So as with any bank, we will have some idiosyncratic events from time to time. We're not going to be immune from them. But I do think that the book is less concentrated now. There are less you know, big exposures, which would be a problem for us if they went uh, wrong. Uh, our exposures are more spread across sectors, spread across geographies. So I would be quietly hopeful that so long as governments are continuing, which I think they have every interest in doing, in supporting country economies as they go through the next stages of COVID, um, that we should see still a reasonably benign um, situation in terms of the credit impairment as we go forward over the next several quarters. Is there a chance that we come out of this um you've got as you said you've got very high stock of provisions um you put aside an extra billion um they've not materially been used could we could we end up with multiple years of subnormal cost of risk or is it or is it a real or is the level of provisions you have a realistic reflection of of what losses you're actually going to take um i think it is more the latter um, you know, we, we've used models as everybody does to, to make projections. We have done some overrides, but they have not been figure in the air. Those have been looking at particular situations, you know, a, a country where our mortgage book has got high loan to value, to, to, to value um, percentages. You know, we, we will possibly be a bit more exposed to the markets that have low LTVs. Um, so there is a science behind it. Um, I think in the majority, the provisions are provisions that you know we'll end up having to swallow at the perimeter. Maybe some of it won't be required, but we're not going to go and release that sort of one off. We're going to let this run for several quarters, and um, you know, just like the India situation was in its second wave, not that uh, envisageable maybe two to three months ago. You know, things will happen in some countries, and I think just know we've got something tucked away in reserve on the balance sheet in case there's a rainy day on some other uninvisible front, I think will be will be helpful. Okay. Um, perhaps if we move on to uh, costs then. Um, you've guided to higher costs this year. I think you, you, you guided to higher costs earlier than the other UK banks did. Um, more restructuring, more investment, um, perhaps a higher variable pay accrual. So what are the, where are the savings and efficiencies coming from in the cost base to, to sort of offset this inflation? And I guess as we're in June now, have you, what's, what's surprising you on the positive and negative side about the evolution of, of the cost base? 
Yeah, so guided to an increase in cost, uh, you know, we had a lower cost base than normal in 2019 because, like many institutions in particular, we accrued less uh, for variable compensation. So if you normalize that out, we were sort of saying at 10 billion guided constant FX for 2021, that actually it would be fairly similar to 2019, but having made that correction. Now that means that we, to achieve that, we have got to take underlying costs out in order to be able to keep the number constant and have absorbed inflation and have absorbed a slightly higher level of IT investment spend. Now that latter phenomena is not new. We have had a cost base, give or take 10 billion for several years now. And I'd say on the average, any one of those years, we probably had to swallow I don't know, 250 billion of inflation, 150 of IT investment, something like that. So about 400 million. So we have had <clears throat> a good track record of taking underlying probably about 400 million out of the costs. And that has therefore funded the increase due to the otherwise increase due to inflation, et cetera. So really what we're trying to do this year is pretty similar to what we have done um, previously. We have had a number of initiatives. You know, we have collapsed the number of regions down. We have moved our small corporates into our big corporates. And each time we do things like that, you know, there's a few tens of millions of savings that come off the back of it. Um, we have said, of course, this year, there's one other factor, which is that the FX translation effect of moving things into dollars um, will put roughly about 300 million onto um, both income and cost, so it will be essentially neutral at a profit level. <clears throat> but it does mean that the 10 billion number for this year, assuming current outlook on on uh, uh, FX, is is more a 10.3 number, and therefore you know quarters should essentially be roughly a quarter of 10.3, and then we're on track. Um, it'll be tight this year, but then it's always tight. You know, people people always find uh, the cost of a uh, challenge. I think in any business, um, a difficult one. But I'd say that uh, we, we are on track for it. And, um, you know, as we get near the back end of the year, we'll obviously make determinations on variable compensation and things like that, which is the only one that could push it outside that envelope. Not massively, um, but that's the only one to my mind. You know, if we do have a good year, we don't want to go and have to put a lid on that um, un unnecessarily. So I think overall, the story on costs is, is a good one. If we look beyond just just this year, how should how should we expect the costs to sort of pan out over 2022, 23, and 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 beyond? Indeed, I mean the efficiencies that we have generated, or the change in business models that, that has come about from COVID, does this fundamentally change the the cost base for any bank, but your bank in particular, obviously? Um, could we see a complete change in the mix of your cost base? Um, I, I don't think it fundamentally changes it. I mean, having kept it essentially flat for about four or five years now, we're sort of saying, look, if we can keep it maybe beyond 2021, so talking about 2022, 2023, maybe there'll be a bit of inflation that we will actually not be able to cover. But the primary reason for not covering it will be the investment that we're making into new business areas. So the investments that we're making into like Mox Bank in, in Hong Kong, the Nexus platform in Indonesia, you know, there will be a little bit more investment cost actually in some of those areas. And realistically, we do not want to starve the business of being able to invest in those areas because we see them as being very important for the future. Um, so we've said beyond this year, we think, you know, costs out of below inflation. And of course, you know, if you link that back to my previous comment, if we have the um, the income growing six, seven percent, we have the cost growing, you know, two percent or whatever, that's only up five percent on fifteen billion a year. And um, you know, you put those together, and then the maths for double digit growth actually sort of come out pretty quickly. Uh, I guess. Well, I guess this was this was kind of answered, but you you're guided to seven percent in twenty twenty three. Heading towards greater than ten percent ROT in, in in 2023, is is it literally as simple as that? Keep um, you'll keep costs at two percent inflation, and you know the high growth regions that you that you operate in should lead should comfortably lead to higher than that in revenue growth. Um, or I guess 
maybe another way to ask it is well, where where's the best opportunities at the moment or where are the best investments that you see the highest returns yeah, I think the combined efforts of 80,000 people actually being sort of condensed into one sentence of uh, being as simple as that probably is, is sort of underplaying it. I, mean, I, I think it's going to be a whole number of levers. Obviously, credit impairments normalising more quickly um, will be helpful, um, albeit maybe by 2023 that have normalised by then anyway, but having them normalised a bit earlier would, would be good for the cause. Um, operationally, the, the income, the cost levers are obvious ones and we need to, to work those. And I think particularly on the income side, it's looking at the areas where there is maybe a bit more potential than we have previously been able to, to benefit from. So uh, what would be an example? Mox, I guess, targeting a slightly younger age audience in Hong Kong to sort of extend the, the customer target group that we could otherwise um, service. Um, looking at other countries where we could do similar, um, the Nexus platform, which is a sort of plug and play so that we can interface with um, internet based players who don't otherwise sell financial services products, you know, something we've not done in the past, something should be um, a bit more additive. Looking at working more with partners outside of the sector um, in the retail consumer space to see whether actually with sort of partnership arrangements we can actually attract um, higher numbers of customers. So I think it's it's sort of putting those together and making sure that that income sort of line is is fortified as much as we possibly can do, and then of course no roti conversation would be complete without referring to the e in roti, um, managing the equity side of it um, thoughtfully, and uh, whether that once we have got clearance, hopefully at some point we'll have more flexibility to be able to do shareholder returns, whether dividends or um, or buybacks. It, it'll be all of those going into the mix. Um, interest rates back to the previous point if they did start to rise that that would clearly be very helpful for the cause as well yeah you've just touched on this but your approach to your approach to capital return going forward i mean with your share price you know, trading below below book value what are you thinking here i mean buyback and dividend and uh, we when, when are we expecting to hear from the pra about whether you can you can actually start paying back in a normal fashion again. So at the moment, they said, um, I think essentially we can accrue, but you know, not pay out. Um, I think a number of parties have said it would be quite helpful if we could actually just uh, reappraise, you know, both the accruing and the paying out bit, so that banks know what basis they can plan the rest of the year. Um, we'll see um, what the PRA do to say. Um, you put that on one side. We are clear that operating above our target range had a purpose in a very volatile year last year, but it isn't a purpose that we see as being one that we need to, um, to, to stick to sort of on an enduring basis. We're very happy to be in the range, the 13 to 14% range, and we would expect the majority of this year to be in the range rather than above it. Um, you're absolutely right, clearly, that um, the share price at the moment does make buybacks pretty attractive. Uh, we equally know some shareholders prefer dividends to buyback. So I think we'll have uh, you know, an eye to both as we decide, as we move through the balance of this year as to what is best to do. And of course, the other ingredient in all of that is how much underlying asset growth there is available to us that is sensibly profitable. If there is good stuff that we can do on that front, we will invest RWAs in that in, in first order. And to the extent that there's anything left over, then we'll look at return side. If we look op operating a um, such a diverse business as Standard Chartered, obviously you come across many, many different regulatory regimes. Your 13 to 14 percent core tier one target, if you grow in an area that has higher capital requirements than, than 13 to 14 percent, is that factored into that range already, so to speak? So if, if you, if you out, outgrow somewhere, are you able to put, maintain your capital target and actually and eventually get that back to shareholders back to that level, almost regardless of your growth pattern? Um, yes, I mean, in giving a single range, we're obviously trying to uh, sort of one sweeping go, sort of try to accommodate many, many factors that work within it. Um, to the extent that we did have a higher proportion of growth in higher RWA countries, then clearly one of the other things we are working on is can we get more of our business to not be uh, balance sheet dependent 
and actually be more fee income based and therefore have that growth in those markets, but not necessarily off a capital consumptive product set. And we, we have increased um, the proportion of our income that is coming from fees, albeit in part mathematically, that's because of the reduction in interest rates. So it is factored in there and you know we monitor it. We, we I don't see any reason for changing that range at all at the moment. I think we'll be happy operating within that for a good period of time. Okay, great. I guess rounding off capital then. Um, I, I think if I compare you to the other UK banks, sort of the your, your capital headwinds are fewer. Um, could you just talk to us about what RWA inflation you have seen potential from credit migration? What, what you expect to see from from the regulator? You know, this year and, and going forward as well? Yeah, I think this year will be a mix of factors. Um, how much profitable underlying client demand is there? Um, as I said earlier, where there is good um, opportunity there that is profitable, we should go for it. Um, we, as ever, are working on lower returning client situations to you know moderate those or, or sometimes to exit. Um, as, as I guess any institution will do. Um, we are looking intensively at the way that we model and um, actually interpret sort of RWA rules, and there's usually some opportunities that come up through that. Um, so I would say that you know, mid-single digit percentages increase in RWA for the 2021 year as a whole, when you put all of that together, probably there or thereabouts where we're at. The only one beyond this year that uh, I, I guess most of us are familiar with is this Basel 3, Basel 4 um, change. We'd had a 5 to 10% range. We probably think it's the lower end of that now. Um, but, you know, is that two years away? You know, maybe. Is it possible it's a bit longer than that? Possibly. So I think in the overall scheme of things, it doesn't change the, the mass significantly. And to your sort of core part of your question, I think something in the mid-single digit uh, percentages growth this year is, is likely where we will be at. And beyond this year, let's strip out the regulation part. Um, does it does it grow in line with asset growth, or or you know you're looking at consumer business, hopefully consumer rebounds. Is is, is it something that RD, could RWA's grow quicker than than loan growth going forward if the mix is going to shift? A um, bit of a crystal ball job, isn't it? Um, you know, directionally, I agree. If, if unsecured is sort of going to rise a bit faster as, as consumer confidence come back, you know, that could put a little up of pressure. On the other hand, unsecured is a small part of our book, and actually, we've got much more that is secured in the consumer space than unsecured. So, I don't think the impact of that will be huge. I think the thing is that we have got in motion to try to manage RWAs equally. There's quite a lot of juice still in the tank. So, I don't think we can keep the growth sort of two or slightly below the rate of nominal growth of the assets over a period of time. All right. Um, lovely. I think we're coming to the end of our time now. Um, so, yeah, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much for um, coming to speak to us, Andy. All right. A pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.